services and you delivery of public amenities and so on, all of it sounds good. But there is something inherently wrong with seeking out information without sufficient checks and balances. And those checks and balances cannot come post facto. They cannot and they should not come from the judiciary. Unfortunately, everyone says, oh, we'll, we'll go to the writ court, we'll go to the high court or the Supreme Court, we'll get directions. There were directions from the Supreme Court even under the telegraph as to how phone top tapping can take place. But I'm afraid the Supreme Court is not expected to run the government. And these are matters that have to be addressed in limine at the very beginning. And unless you do it, I'm appalled that this Aadhaar business has run for four years without any legs to stand on. I'm also surprised that uh, it hasn't been declared as, as illegal as yet. I believe there is a challenge pending. Uh, but I'm surprised that it still continues to hold force. And the disturbing part is that it, strong accusations have been made that the government wants to hoodwink you. Fair enough. But why are we getting hoodwinked? What is it that civil society is doing about this? I'm afraid not. There was a, a client of mine who works with a very leading publishing house, and she dropped me a mail saying, my HR manager has asked me to get my Aadhaar card. Is it compulsory? I said, of course not. Please write back to him and say no. And what did she do? She, instead of sort of replying just to her HR manager, sent a, a CC to all her colleagues in the office. So as it turned out, none of them sort of put their hand up for Aadhaar. So the HR manager was very distraught. He said, Madam, you need not have told the others at, at least, but he did. But this is the sort of disinformation, misinformation that is, is being uh, circulated, and we're not asking enough questions. This is now the case also with the BCCI. Maybe not on a privacy aspect, but I've long argued, and I've written a piece in, in your NLS journal as well, as to the need to le legislate on cricket. People have said, no, why? You want to nationalize the sport. You want to bring in politicians. You don't want market economy, blah, blah. But no, no, I think your my case is proved now. BCCI is not under RTI. BCCI is not under RTI. BCCI is not state as per the Supreme Court judgment. BCCI is a society registered under the West Bengal Act and wields extraordinary economic power, selects your national team, makes and breaks careers, and now I believe is beginning to involve itself in some rather extravagant uh, aspects of the game. You don't have a law dealing with match fixing today. You prosecute uh, individuals under cheating, under an IPC, which is uh, 100 years and more old. And why? You do that because you haven't applied your mind to it. Sport is a state subject. The center needs to either bring it into the concurrent list or exercise special constitutional powers. I know it's difficult. But do we see the bona fides? Do we see the effort being made? No. And in the absence of that, you're continuing with this spirit of ad hocism. I do concede that my comments about BCCI have pretty much nothing to do with your, your topic on, on uh, privacy and data and so on. But there is a larger point which you need to appreciate, which is symptomatic of what's going on. Fine, Aadhaar doesn't have legislation or regulatory, like, regulatory power. But that's not an exception. I'm afraid it's the rule. If I add to that IB, RAW, NPRO, Planning Commission, BCCI, the list is endless. And nobody is talking about curtailing state powers in cases of necessity. The legislation in the UK or the US has not hindered those very fine intelligence agencies from maintaining secrecy of operation. It has only legitimized their existence. And there's a world of difference between the two. Therefore, friends, since many of you are, are uh, lawyers or law students and grapple with the law, I believe that apart from the nitty-gritty, the nitty-gritty is extremely important, but apart from the nitty-gritty, please ask the larger question as to what is the legitimacy of this exercise you're undertaking. And I'd like to leave you with that thought. Thank you. No, sir. When you have spoken so well about that is already there with us the election commission, with this uh, income tax authorities, uh, the public undertaking, the data is already, they are codifying it in centralized form, and they should have made it voluntary. They are almost out of coercion or fear, under the protection of LPG sitting there like that, they induce household wife, practically the persons become almost slaves in the hands of domestic people, and we hurriedly go through that. 
What about illiterate people? They blindly fill up the data. What is the assurance of the data being valid? The whole scheme is very futile. When that was brought to my notice, I deferred it. All my neighbors, they are telling me, sir, we got our uh, cylinder and he was also getting done. The cylinder supplier was threatening me. I feel it should be a voluntary one. It cannot be a forceful one. It should not be done through coercion and fear. That has been the case with several other people. Why not you people, like the Supramani Swami, uh, just uh, suggest the Supreme Court whether it is legally valid without parliament approval. And uh, I think you can bring to the you know, being a Supreme Court advocate. He can do something about the other scheme. And Supreme Court may hold the view that he should be scrapped. Sir, unlike uh, Dr. Swami, I don't appear in person in any cases. So, until and unless I have a, a suitor or a willing client to file a petition on that score. Or you can instigate somebody. Don't, I think uh, it should be brought to the to Supreme Court. Maybe, maybe we have a petitioner in yourself. <laughs> Um, I don't have the resources to do Just to chip in on that, uh, there is a petition which has already been filed. Uh, one is <coughs> by me. I filed a civil suit, which is now under appeal in the Karnataka High Court, along with Thomas Shaikh, who is my co-petitioner. There is a petition filed in the High Court in Mumbai. There is a petition filed in Chennai. Both these two are filled. Uh, I also propose to approach the Supreme Court Already Justice Puttaswamy has filed a bill in the Supreme Court and uh, that petition as well as the three. They have gone only under that. But uh, my petition as well as national security. <coughs> okay, um, are there any other uh, questions for Mr. Swamy? So in the tea break a while before the session as well. Can you, practically speaking, the notion of regulating government surveillance, isn't that idealistic to say the least? I mean, the example of, of you know the president's office itself being being tapped shows that there is there seems to be no limit whatsoever on um, on surveillance. So, wouldn't it be probably more appropriate to say um, control access to whatever is surveyed, to control access to uh, say uh, intercepted materials, rather than controlling the interception itself? That I'm afraid is the question. First and foremost is what is the need for the information that is part of surveillance? How does an authority legitimize the need to procure that information? And who decides that? That has to be codified. If that is not, it becomes a completely arbitrary and ad hoc exercise. It could be voyeuristic. It could be out of professional enmity. It could be as the IB itself has conceded in many articles written by its former chiefs and so on, that about 60% of its time is spent on political espionage which means spying on political rivals within your own party, outside your party, or otherwise doing work related to possibility of election outcomes in states, drought, and so on. And this is being done because intelligence agencies are being abused in a sense by the government. I'm not saying that can't happen. The CBI today has a statute, it has even been uh, indicated by the Supreme Court in Vineet Narayan and more recently in the Colgate case that there is a pressing need to make the CBI more autonomous because despite its statutory framework it is still abused by the government I'm not ruling that out but in the absence of law the scope to abuse is that much greater does does a political leader even bother to check what the role of an intelligence agency is and unless that is set in stone it affects both sides to the, to the case. It affects not only the citizens who are being subjected to these cross uh, activities of, of surveillance. My own case, for instance, I'll give you. Let me assume that I am being, that my office is bugged. Let me assume, hypothetically. In order for that to happen, there ought to have been, firstly, a legislation that empowered the agency to do so. Secondly, an application of mind by an authority at a very high level would apply his or her mind, subjectively satisfy himself or herself that I pose some threat or I possess some information which is needed in the larger realm of national security and only then could such action be taken. And equally, I should have a right then to apply under the RTI and say, am I bugged or not? Please tell me. Do you think any of this exists? And if it doesn't, where, I, where is the question then of treatment of information? I am not guarding my privacy because I have something to hide. 
I really don't care how that information is used as long as it, as long as let's say confidential conversations a lawyer has had with his client are not publicly shared. But that's not the issue. I'm saying there is a violation at the threshold when you're even obtaining information. And those checks and balances, that exercise of power has to come from statute, it has to come from law. If it doesn't, then you're a banana republic. Enormous sums of money is budgeted and given to them, and there's no accounting whatsoever. They just spend it on themselves. And they spend, they buy equipment, and they they monitor anybody whom they feel like. In fact, that has come out in the papers also that General V.K. Singh was accused of bugging somebody else, as well as uh, somebody is trying to bug General V.K. Singh. So huge sums of money are being spent on that. In the United States, there's a Senate Committee on Intelligence. The Parliament oversees the functioning of these people. Where the same applies to UK or France or anywhere else. Any sensible country would have Parliament. They are all nationalists. They're not going to leak the information, but they control this agency. It's not left to the uh, uh, bureaucrats or the chiefs to do whatever they want. In fact, I was, uh, in the predecessor of war, I was a volunteer establishment ready to in Tibet. And I know what these agencies do. They just spend public money on themselves. Uh, I wanted to tell you one more fact. In Bangalore, are you aware, anybody is aware, what is a BPL card? Have you have heard of BPL cards, no? What is a BPL that's what the Aadhaar is going to check, leakages in public distribution subsidies and all. I am not saying, I am. I have worked with the department for 25 years. Food, civil supplies and consumer affairs is part of the same department. 17,000 is the salary per annum, which is required for a BPL card. Can you believe I'm repeating? 17,000 per year. A beggar gets 100 rupees per day, 3,000 rupees per month. He is not eligible. He or she is not eligible. 17,000 for the family. So, what Matthew mentioned is 75 lakhs, 55 lakhs, the entire BPL is itself bogus. So, you have not still determined when Montek Singh Aluwal have brought up 32 rupees as the a threshold for power poverty, the view and cry. Still, they have not decided. So there are a lot of loopholes in between. Do not plug any of them. You have a Y card. You have other things. So we did a program, like uh, he was mentioning on biometrics, on iris. We did a program with the principal secretary to government, the e-governance, Mr. Vidya Shankar. We faked. Biometric, we faked Irish and showed it to him for 30 rupees. And what happened to that? Subsequently, he called us privately. He said, he called us to Vidhan Sada and show us what is happening. Till date, nothing has happened. And what did he say in that meeting, public meeting like this? He said, people owning BMW cars have BPL cars. That is why we are having Aadhaar. Can you laugh at this particular joke? He said, BMW car owners, people, are having other cards, I mean, are having BPL cards. That is why we wanted to bring other to control. Because somebody has uh, MN Vidya Shankar, MNV Shankar, M N V. This is, they have one in the identity at dot 15. That is why we want to bring. All fallacies to an educated class. So nothing like being alert. We have to know where the data, how the data, purpose of data has to be used. I just want to supplement this a little more. The need for regulation is not only for data uh, protection or collection. These are authorities that are, like it was mentioned, dealing with public funds. And the question is, what's the source of funds? How are they being audited? That audit process is missing as far as secret service funds are concerned. So public funds are being, and large amounts, let me tell you, 
running into hundreds of courts, are being kept aside for these purposes. No questions asked. In many ways, even the government can't ask questions of it. Because an intelligence officer is going to say, I spent it on my source. Whether it was spent to buy a good dinner or to buy a more expensive present for his wife, nobody knows, nobody cares. Even the government can't regulate its own funds. Forget about the citizens. And therefore, you're now dealing with authorities. Data collection is one aspect. There are many, many other aspects to the, to the exercise of powers by these authorities, funds, service aspects, so on and so forth. And all of that, where do you find it? Where do I find the constitution of this authority? Where do I find its charter? Where do I find its powers? Who is it accountable to? What is the oversight over it? These are the questions that arise in a larger sense of governance. And that has to be addressed at the inception. Uh, okay, uh, we have gone terribly over time and we still have a student speaker. Uh, so this is what I, I propose we do. We have a student speaker on, we take questions offline. Okay, we are all, we are all here. There's dinner here after this panel as well. Okay, so nobody's running away. So with that. I am running away though. Okay. So if there is one other question <laughs> I can take. Uh, the focus of this discussion, I guess, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm just, you know, a little confused. Um, <clears throat> Do you mean to say that you know the, uh, by you know government handling this whole project as such? I'm sorry, uh, by government initiating this project as uh, of Aadhaar as such. Um, uh, do you mean to say that the data which is collected can be used for uh, uh, selling it off to corporates um, or, or or whoever buys them? Number one. Number two. Is there a possibility of misuse of this data? which might infringe upon the citizen's privacy as such. And in the absence of a privacy law, a surveillance law, um, uh, you know, a lack of def a definition of, uh, you know, surveillance as such. So is, is, it, is it a possibility that it is a non-starter? No, no, that's precisely what I'm saying. Under this bill, there is a provision, a saving clause, which says that every piece of information that is procured or every action that is carried out under the notification of 2009 is deemed to be done under the bill, which means what effectively it's trying to do is save everything that has been done in between, which itself concedes that all of that was done without legitimacy. That is a legal aspect. Then comes the abuse. Yes, I did say so in so many words. I've, I've perhaps uh, seen and read enough to, to believe that there is a great risk of it being commercialized, that is the data. And what General Mohammed Kere has talked about, I haven't probed further, but it's certainly food for thought which people need to ask, that what if the agencies that are participating in this tender are uh, closely working with foreign intelligence agencies? Is, there not a, is, is it not a self-defeating process? Then rather than serving national interest, it may very well end up defeating national interest. So I'm saying exactly that. I'm sorry to interrupt one question. That's it. No, we've gone 20 minutes over time. I'm really sorry. Half a sentence will promote. The half a sentence will promote an entire book now. <laughs> Please, let's stop right we'll, now. We'll stay back. We'll, no, because, because there's a student who's still waiting for. Uh, we'll I just want to yeah. say that in the absence of data security, there could be this, uh, you know, uh, uh, data collection that is not done properly. It boils down to having the Supreme Court interpret Article 21 and give you the right of privacy. Sorry, Apple, but that's what it boils down to. And that's not what the Supreme Court is always meant to do. That, that must come from Parliament. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
check the mail sent by college. Went and stood there for the UID camp. And, uh, and I think that was something around which I was writing the abstract for conciliance. So my co-author and I actually went and coaxed half our classmates telling them not to endow themselves. We almost took upon ourselves the onus of sort of creating awareness within our own peer group saying why being students of law, we had to question the very basis of something like this in the lack of any legislation. And so I shall go on my presentation, I'll keep it very short, consider the fact that most of what I was going to say has been spoken by our honorable panelists. Um, so we started off with questioning one of the basic fundamental rights. Um, one of the um, rights which is recognized worldwide as basic to human life, uh, the right to privacy. So you have uh, various international in instruments which recognize the right to privacy. And, this is, and in this context, we're talking about information privacy, wherein it's not about decisional privacy wherein you're asking whether I can abort a child or not, but where you're questioning what the data that you give to someone or the data you withhold with yourself, what can be done with the data and can the state act as a big brother in collecting such data from you, notwithstanding what the purpose of collection is. So uh, there is no Indian legislation on privacy as such, and it was beyond the Supreme Court of India within various legislations um, in, uh, with a broad interpretation of Article 21, recognized the right to privacy as an inherent part of right to life and liberty in India. And in Menekar Gandhi versus Union of India, it very clearly laid down how that there has to for any violation of life and liberty, there has to be a procedure established by law. And ladies and gentlemen, very clearly as spoken by everyone in the past two days, Aadhaar does not have any legislative backing, nor does any other governing scheme in India. So coming to the issue of surveillance, here we are talking about a liberal democratic state in India becoming an information state, wherein the content of the information as such is not a value, but it's the collection and the surveillance practices adopted by the state that make it all the more valuable. So of course, the need of the state to have information about all of the activities of the citizen is slightly misplaced. And a, and a case in point is the UID itself. So as is aware, it's a 12 digit number and the endowment process is a grand scheme and where people like my grandfather and grandmother being educated citizens themselves spend hours in the sun in a post office waiting to get it done without even realizing what the repercussions of such an endowment would be. So and of course the Supreme Court's notice in uh, in uh, after a PIL was filed to the Ministry of Finance, Pla Planning Commission and the UIDI was obviously ignored and nothing has been done um, in pursuance of that. In fact, even the Standing Committee on Finance, a 40 second report, has clearly said that UID has no basis in law, that it was directionless and it was just an, it was just adding to the exchequer of country, it did not even have any financial uh, it did not even reduce the finances, uh, the amount spent on other schemes by any extent at all. And even if the UID were to be given legitimate backing, you would have to make amendments to the Citizenship Act and you would have to uh, bring about an entire policy legislation in place. And ladies and gentlemen, we need to bear in mind that we can't have a law which is retrospective in effect. What has happened to people like my grandparents who have given their documents, who have given their biometrics, their iris scan, and very well knowing that the biometric or the iris scan is bound to change. In fact, nowhere in the world has such a big, has such a big exercise in biometric information collection ever been done. And it has been, um, and it's been submitted by various reports and one even by the UNDP stating that how could people who are, in, who indulge themselves in laborious activities like laborers, manual scavengers, they do not have fixed uh, uh, fingerprints, ladies and gentlemen. What happens to people like that? There is a great, there is a great possibility of say X person's fingerprints getting matched with that person's, and what happens to uh, to the whole question of your identity and your identification, what you believe as your own information to be, um, and the ostensible outsourced service-oriented infrastructure of um, the UIDAI, wherein your public-private partnerships are talked about, hailed. Mr. Nandan Nilekani himself has confessed in. Um, very recently saying that the government will be a customer in the hands of these public company, uh, in, in the hands of these private companies who are handling the data. So what happens, we as citizens of India elect our own government, we, elect a, we are a sovereign nation, we are a sovereign state, we have our own nation state. However, the very state is subjected to the invisible state. That 
that is the corporate households, the big companies, and the multivariate um, uh, foreign government. I think a few. I think the French government is involved. Has a stake in one of the companies which has been authorized by the UIDAI for enrollment. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are various various questions that arise, including the question of voluntariness. As as I said, Mr. Nandan Nilayani very clearly says that oh yes, the UID is voluntary. However, if any other governmental organisation or any other authority wants to make it mandatory, he has no say as such. So, isn't this like an internal contradiction within the state itself, wherein you are saying that it's voluntary, but on the other hand, you're saying no. You don't want to get it done. It's not. However, um, every day you see in the paper where you are, I think the provident fund um, scheme and a whole lot of other schemes are also being uh, made mandatory uh, uh, with the UID. Um, another interesting scheme is the CCTNS, which is I think completely different from Aadhaar and everything else. This is another scheme of actually tracking and and having surveillance um, and and you know having records of criminals or suspects. So this synchronizes the databases of courts, jails, immigration, passport authorities, and a whole list of various authorities. And the question remains: Is what happens to such data? Computerization of such data without any legislative backing, other than a notification or a policy, or where the National Crime Records Bureau, the secretary or whoever is heading it, comes and says that this is 